All right, everyone, and welcome. It is uh, 2 p.m. here in the Eastern Time Zone on a Friday. Uh, and welcome to our uh, Hubcast here at Cyber Social Hub. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know what um, Cyber Social Hub is, let me educate you real quick. So if you're doing any type of digital investigations, um, whether it be computer forensics, mobile forensics, cybersecurity, um, or who I'm about to talk to with my guest today, who's fluent in many of those, uh, OSINT or Open Source Intelligence or Information Gathering, then um, what we are is just an online community. Think of us as like the uh, LinkedIn, Facebook type style um, without the annoyance of all the things that go on in those feeds. Well, occasionally I'm, I'm, I'm annoying in, uh, in Cyber Social Hub. Uh, I, I used to claim that there were no cat memes until I posted a couple. So now, now they're actually there. Um, for that. And uh, hey, Megan. Yes, it is indeed Friday. I see you're, you're, you're in there. And no, uh, I know Megan was helping me test a little bit before we had started. And it was not you. It was indeed me. I had two uh, windows open. I had another tab open. It was probably feeding back the system audio uh, through it. So uh, I, uh, I shut it down too. Um, or maybe you did have two windows open. I'm reading your text here. But before I go any further, again, if you haven't joined Cyber Social Hub, it is 100% free. Uh, and there is no catch. Occasionally you get an email from us and you may or may not get an email from us. And that's some of the frustration we've been dealing with. I was just talking to my guest uh, who's still sitting in the green room here about uh, some of the email frustration woes. It is so difficult to really find a good service that doesn't, you know, obviously our goal here at, at the Hub is not to spam anyone, right? We want to provide relevant information out to people. Uh, about various topics, about things that maybe uh, investigative techniques that they're having challenges with. Um, and, and that's really what we provide. Never, ever spam. But finding a good service with email that can send, that doesn't cost me a trillion dollars <laughs> for, for our list, is, is, what's, uh, is what's challenging. And that's been some of the woes. So, um, yeah, that's why uh, hopefully uh, you guys got the email and, on here. And maybe you did, maybe you didn't. But without further ado, um, let's go ahead and get into our uh, our guest here, and I'm going to bring up Mike here. Maybe there's Mike. How are you, man? And thanks uh, for uh, taking your Friday and spending some time with us, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, excited to be here and uh, uh, another cool and interesting topic. So, yeah, um, that that's kind of uh, you know we we jump around because you know obviously you and mo and most people that have, have heard of you or maybe heard some of your talks are known. You're you're pretty solid in the cybersecurity world, right? Um, and it's interesting that you've, uh, I mean, you've seen the pivot over that and then the necessity for that, for the OSINT type of information, how they kind of go hand in hand, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's something I've been doing research in for many years. Um, and uh, I think in the last couple of years has really hit a peak with people in terms of um, the plethora of data out there how they can acquire it and what the value of it really is and really understanding the the trustworthiness of it as well. Yeah. And that, and that's the biggest challenge, right? I mean, we've seen it for several years now. It's probably been longer than that, but I think the public, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, has become more aware or at least, uh, you know, the media is pointing it out. Oh, that's uh, what's the coin term? Fake news, right? Is that <laughs> the, the term that's been going around? Um, or you think it's just people becoming more aware of kind of misinformation out there or, you know, the fact that we're everywhere's connected, uh, especially the topic we're about to talk about a little bit, um, that the information is more readily available? Yeah, um, I think it's a combination of all of that. You know, I think headline news um, tends to blow out of proportion, you know, disinformation, although many times it's justified, but you know, there's so much more information out there that that's very trustworthy and, and used in the right way, validated in the right way, um, can be actually incredibly valuable. Um, you know, that was sort of the genesis behind some research we did recently and continue to do around um, the, the Russian-Ukrainian war uh, that's currently going on that we've been monitoring since day one. And I think the genesis behind that was to determine how trustworthy a lot of that data coming in would be and and how could we improve upon that trustworthiness you know how do we filter out disinformation or you know specific types of data that um, are sort of questionable that can't be validated 
Um, I mean, there's a plethora of data that you can crowdsource through, you know, OSINT techniques mm -hmm. and then further filter, categorize, validate the trustworthiness and, and build a methodology around that that really gives you very solid data by which you can do predictive analysis, by which you can monitor activities, boots on the ground and more of what may be occurring within the war. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Now, I, I want to pivot a little bit to, to let people, I, I know, obviously, we've had you on a Hubcast before. I think it was, I think it was April, maybe, uh, sometime that we had you on. And to, to get people to know you a little bit in your background in the industry and, and how you got started in all the chaos. Now, obviously, I know the crazy story that you had told me and we brought up in the last Hubcast, which is still funny. But uh, I don't know if you wanted to share that, how you got started, or, or really... How, how do you get really interested in your roots in, in cybersecurity and all the technology investigation? Yeah, so um, I started out uh, actually playing in a heavy metal band <laughs> after I got out of power. <laughs> uh, you know, um, recorded all kinds of stuff toward. And um, when the bottom kind of fell out of that, um, I needed to really fall back on my degree. Um, which at the time was in electrical engineering. And um, I had the opportunity to uh, get in the tech industry. I took advantage of that and landed a job at NASDAQ around the early 90s. Mm. And uh, working at the, the NASDAQ stock market was great. Lots of incredible technology there. And, um, you know, always been a, a curious person. So, um, you know, being a Unix system administrator and Oracle DBA at the time, um, I found myself managing the firewalls, managing DNS and bind, and a lot of that network infrastructure and how to protect it. So um, one day um, I downloaded a tool, um, a vulnerability scanning tool, long before there was Nessus or you know any of the commercial products out there, um, a product called Satan, of all things, which was an acronym <laughs> for... Uh, kind of a, a, you know, an analysis tool right. uh, from a security guy at the time by the name of Dan Farmer. And uh, downloading the tool, I decided to run it, you know, on a lot of our systems um, on the trading floor in the middle of the day. Um, and it knocked over a server, which took down the stock market. So <laughs> obviously it wasn't one of my better days um, and was certainly grounds for being fired. And uh um, I was called into the CISO's office, although they didn't call him CISO's back then. And he said, Mike, I'm, I'm here to offer you one of two options. You're either fired or you can take a promotion. <laughs> so <laughs> I decided, you know, I'll take the promotion. I couldn't go home and tell my wife I'd been fired. So I took the promotion and asked questions later. But he said, you know, you clearly demonstrated that you can take down the network. Now it'll be your job to protect it by building out a team that'll be focused on security here at NASDAQ. And so that was sort of how I got into security at the time. And I've been doing it ever since. Nice. And there's a lot of foreign powers trying to achieve exactly what you did uh, by mistake, right? <laughs> true, true. <laughs> <laughs> I still think that's a, that's a hilarious uh, story. So this heavy metal band, I'm curious, what, uh, uh, what would you guys do? Did you write original songs? Did you play some, like cover uh, stuff? What, what did you do? Yeah, we had original songs. We recorded, um, we were, based in the Washington DC area at the time, which is where I lived at that time mm -hmm. and uh, toured around. We opened for some notable bands um, that, you know, are uh, household names and um, it, you know, it was a great time. And so we um, wandered into an open mic night um, just to try out some new songs. And they informed us that it was a big battle of the bands for a record contract. And um, so we, uh, you know, we decided, hey, you know, we got a bunch of material. Let's just get up and play. What do we have to lose? Because right. they actually had an open slot because one band didn't show up. So long story short, we played, we won, and we found that we would be in the final battle off, which was uh, going to be a couple weeks later. So mm -hmm. then we showed up for that. We won that. And uh, that's how we got, you know, a record deal, essentially. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it kind of worked out really, really well. So. That's that's pretty awesome. Do you have like uh, the actual like album art or well, how, how was it released? Did you? I do. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to share it with you sometime. Oh, um, yeah. We'll, we'll you know, I have. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'll share that with you. You probably get a kick out of it. It was back when I had a lot more hair than I have now. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, I just remember I, I, I remember hearing about your record deal uh, 
prior to, but I'm like, I wonder if that album art is still there. Uh, and how was it released? I'm just curious. Um, was it like uh, uh, CD? Was it into the CD genre at that point? Or were you still on the big it was. Uh, 33s? Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, like at that time, they would sort of do a limited release and see, you know, how popular and, and, and you know, people would actually buy it and if it would sell out. Uh, and in addition to that, we got, um, there was a uh, uh, kind of a mini kind of MTV type of uh uh, channel um, in the Maryland, D.C., Virginia area uh-huh. broadcast the 4 million homes. So we got a lot of um, TV coverage that way uh, where we played three songs, almost like music videos mm-hmm. um, where, you know, it would play over and over and over. So that, that was good traction at the time, too. So but we all know what happened in the 90s. So <laughs> <laughs> that, that ended quickly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, that's pretty awesome, man. Um, so with, I'm going to, I'm going to switch tracks back to, I guess, so the topic, uh, at hand is with OSINT and the Ukraine, um, Mm -hmm. obviously, you know, it's different than what we've seen in past wars, um, just because of the, the sheer volume of information that you can get. What, what are, what are some of your favorite sources to, to pull information that is just readily apparent really to anyone that they can they can grab out of there so yeah you know taking a step back and kind of looking at what are we going to use for for sources of data and how are we going to get you know really valuable data versus you know the plethora of posts that may occur the the fake news and disinformation peppered Mm -hmm. across that um and you know There's also the, you know, the influence of uh, lots of posts of old pictures from previous wars or other things that are irrelevant to the Russian Ukrainian war, but are posted as claiming to be, you know, from that war. Um, And how does that all kind of blend together across multiple social networks so that we can leverage the unique intelligence from each network, blend that together and use that to increase the trustworthiness of that data? And then to take that trustworthy data and do a variety of things. Mm -hmm. One is, could we build out a timeline from that data? So when, um, uh, you know, a tank or Russian troops were identified in certain regions or when a building was destroyed, things like that, and start to stitch together that data to build out a timeline. But then furthermore, based on the timeline, could we do predictive analysis of where, you know, the Russian troops may move next? and what their next targets may be by mapping it on a map, by mapping it chronologically. And it was quite interesting as we went through that data. Now to bring it full circle back to your question, what social networks did we use? Mm -hmm. Um, We started with Twitter. And um, as you know, um, we've talked a lot, you and I around, you know, um, GeoOSINT and how there's APIs within Tweepy uh, and the Twitter API that allow you for um, to allow you basically to um, kind of geolocate at the time of post um, when someone has made a post from that region. Um, and so um, while although the social networks as a challenge, many of them remove metadata, including location data, you can alternatively do live data collection, specify a geo, in this case being you know the greater Ukraine area, and collect only posts originating from that area. Thus, the person making the post is somewhere in the Ukraine. Mm-hmm. You can you know, specify the geo uh, to a smaller region such as Kiev or um, even a region within Kiev or other cities as well to really pinpoint activities that are going on. This fundamentally gives us more valuable data, almost like boots on the ground without physically being there. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty amazing that that it's able to to do that. I mean, it, it really is. Um, so, So tell me... What, what types of activity are, are you looking for? Are you guys collecting everything? Or are you more interested in, um, in the image? Yeah, so, um, so there's a couple of ways in which we handle it. So um, to further round, round out what we're using beyond Twitter, uh, we're also using Discord, Facebook, and Instagram. Hmm. So those four allow us to cross-correlate the data. Mm-hmm. Also, there are many Twitter links that are posted to Discord that then point back to Twitter and determining the origination of where that individual is making those posts too. Uh, So that builds out the model a lot better. 
and then um, really kind of taking that data and then blending it together to then kind of focus on well, what kind of data do we want to gather here and how do we further filter that data? Because people are making posts other than what's related to the war, right? Right. So, um, so some of the things that we used um, included um, keywords and hashtags, but additionally in languages other than English, right? You know, in the Ukraine, they have Ukrainian. I think about 60% of the people speak Ukrainian and 30%, which is the second language, speak Russian. So we took a mashup of keywords in those two languages, added them to the filter in the search. So as we're gathering these tweets, it's based on keywords in English, Ukrainian, and Russian relevant to the war. It could be, you know, uh, Ukraine, it could be war, it could be uh, the cities, you know, the cities as we see it on a Google map might be Kiev and other things, but when you kind of dis then distinguish it in Ukrainian or Russian, it might have a slightly different spelling. So we would incorporate those to get, you know, more valuable data uh, in that manner too. Um, and then in addition, um, you know, we really wanted to, you know, leverage the ability to crowdsource this data. Um, you know, one of the, the things we wanted to fundamentally debunk um, is that, well, this data isn't trustworthy. And mm -hmm. there might be a case for that um, if, if you're not in the know, right? But for those of us, and there's many people, you know, in the OSINT industry know that you can take that data and do a lot of intelligence things with it to right. weed out the fake news, to weed out the irrelevant data, to validate the trustworthiness of that data. Yeah. And, and so, and, and I guess a little bit of reason we're talking about this, I'm not trying to get too deep in the weeds on it because you have a webinar you're going to give and Megan, you're going to have to help me out here. I think it's next week, right? Probably what Wednesday or Thursday, probably Thursday. Yeah. Yep. We'll be talking about the, the findings of that research. Okay. And you're going to get into like a, a lot more detailed information of uh, how you acquired the data and kind of the, the breakdown of some of that data. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Some of the other details around verification of the data, um, eliminating disinformation, you know, you mentioned earlier, you know, like what kind of data are you collecting? And we're collecting the tweets and the emojis um, that only filtered information, but the emojis also get, you know, categorized based on sentiment too, right? Oh, okay. The sentiment geared towards Ukraine versus Russia. What are the, the weighing scales of that? <laughs> uh, additionally, um, you know, if we see uh, a tweet, um, or post, you know, originating from uh, the Ukrainian area that falls into that categorization. Um, what's the trustworthiness of that from the perspective of, is it a verified account? Does this account normally post a lot of information like this? Um, what are the vectors, as we call them, correlated to other people they're connected with and the, the trustworthiness of the data that they're posting? Mm -hmm. You know, so that, that all gets scored out to really build out a model of really valuable and trustworthy data. Hmm, that's interesting. I always find it fascinating with the sentiment um, in, in emojis. Now, obviously, as as people, we generally get the drift of what the emojis are, um, unless mm -hmm. you get like uh, like one of my staff, Megan, for example, who's here. She speaks fluently in GIF and emojis. She's very good at it. <laughs> so <laughs> I have to look and say, okay, what does she mean by this? And I'm just curious on, is there, uh, did you guys have to write that from scratch or did you grab some, some open code that help you initially? Because like, you know, again, I'm going to get a little ridiculous on your mic. So I'm going to apologize in advance. Like the no poop worries. emoji for crying out loud. What, what, I mean, that could go either way, really. If somebody's making a joke about something, right. I mean, how right. hard is that to, to kind of dig through all of this data and, and determine mm -hmm. the sentiment on it? Yeah, I think. You know, how we look at the emoji stuff is, is a little bit complementary to the fundamental post itself or the mm -hmm. tweet and things like that. So leveraging, you know, NLP or natural language processing, uh -huh. um, also knowing if there are, um, you know, words that are not found in the English language, but are more slang, you know, things like that, or things around the event or the activity also sometimes get built out too. We've seen with previous elections and other things like, you know, nicknames and stuff applied to the candidates and stuff like that. Sure. So leveraging, you know, lots of cool and interesting data like that allows us to then determine, you know, the effectiveness of it. 
in addition, what's what we found that's really interesting is when you talk about emojis and emoticons, um, many of them, although not all, are mapped by each and every respective social network. So if you're on Facebook versus Discord versus Twitter, um, you may see some or all of the same emojis. Um, you may see some that it, the, the social network doesn't know how to render it. But then if we look at it on Discord or Facebook, it does know how to render it, hmm. meaning that when um, the, the emojis show up, you may see something that you didn't see in the Twitter post that shows, let's say, for example, randomly like a swastika or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Those are not all mapped necessarily across each and every social network in a uniform way. There are some that are missing and some that are occluded for each social network. So um, from an interesting you know, analysis perspective that also provides interesting information too. So while, you know, to use your example from a humorous perspective, right? Say we see, you know, a poop emoji, right? But then, you know, in a discord post or in something else, we see a poop emoji and then a swastika, right? Yeah. That certainly kind of changes the sentiment of that post, right? Sure. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. If they're using combination with other, that's gotta be a challenging, I mean, how much, uh, and again, just out of, out of curiosity, OSINT was, we never really call it that when I was doing investigations. I don't, I don't know what, when that term actually started becoming popular. Maybe I was just like out of the, the mainstream know of it all. But, you know, uh, we, we just collect information on Intel on the Internet. Uh, but how much with, with this specifically with the Ukraine that you've been collecting information on, and again, I don't want to put you on the spot with it. If it, a guess is fine with how much do you, you think is, you know, real information versus the, the disinformation uh, balance in that that you guys are seeing? Yeah, I think if you categorize um, or have different categories of disinformation, which may be someone who, from one perspective, is trying to influence opinion in a in a way that is not true mm -hmm. um, versus people that are. Um, retweeting stuff, believing that it's true versus people that are posting pictures from 10, 12 years ago related to a completely different war in a different region. There's a lot of disinformation and the motives behind that vary, right? Mm. Um, so um, it's more than just how we think about it from a headline news perspective, which is, um, you know, did Biden really say that or didn't he? You know, um, it, right. it's more of a case of there's a lot of layers to that, you know, what we find, at least, you know, doing all the war analysis. Mm -hmm. um, so we look at those different layers to kind of vet that out. For example, as, as a, a tangent, um, we actually have a, a fake image analysis tool um, in our product suite, too, that can be used to determine if anything as simple as uh, an image has been photoshopped to something AI generated, you know, is fake. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one layer we can use for the, that common scenario of disinformation. But when you start to take a look at, um, well, it's a real picture, but did it, you know, is this something that really occurred in this time frame in the Ukraine? Or did we determine this was something that happened in Croatia or somewhere else 10 sure. years prior, right? right. Um, and that requires a whole different level of analysis to kind of vet that out too. I think focusing on the geo OSINT perspective, you know, of, of the geo around the Ukraine for the source of those posts has weeded out um, a lot of the um, pictures that are used necessarily from the past, you know, because I think a lot of people outside of the Ukraine are just kind of tweeting and retweeting all kinds of interesting things that they find, mm -hmm. whereas the boots on the ground or the people that were crowdsourcing in that region are certainly providing a higher level of, of valuable data that's legitimate. You know, right. um, so um, so to answer your point question or bring it full circle back to your question, you know, how much do you find is disinformation? I think fundamentally we weeded that out based on our approach, not completely, you know, but compared to like a um, normal disinformation um, versus, you know, what we saw, you know, and I continue to see is less. I would say it's maybe somewhere between three and five percent is disinformation oh wow okay of, of one of those many categories right so sure sure absolutely and that's um you know i blame the uh the, the twitter bots and the reason elon musk would not buy twitter on that right there <laughs> yeah yeah because 
you know, allegedly it's, it's much higher. Right. But we don't, <laughs> right. you know, I don't know that for a fact, but just reading, you know, like <laughs> the headlines and all those storylines surrounding that, who knows. Right. right. So, yeah. No, exactly. Now you've done some interesting work and um, again, I don't want to dig too much into it, but man, the information is phenomenal. Oh, before I forget though, um, if you guys are really interested in this uh, topic um, and you're watching this hubcast at any time on YouTube, whether you're catching it now live or maybe in the future when it's recorded um, out there, there's a link down in the description um, for Mike's full webinar. Now, obviously, if you click it now, uh, pre-webinar, you can just go and register and then it'll remind you to go to it. But um, if you're watching this afterwards, then it, it automatically goes, I don't know if it's automatic, but it does go into uh, a replay mode automatically uh, or Megan uh, uh, button push uh, automatically. Uh, and then it goes, it goes into that mode and that way you can watch it anytime. So regardless, I guess really what I'm trying to say is click the link, whether it's in the future or past, and you can watch the webinar. That's a much easier way of saying it. Um, so there, there that is. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure it's the right link down there. Um, so make sure you, uh, you guys check that out. And, uh, on that note, Mike is you guys have been doing some interesting work with, uh, some images and, um, how do I want to, and tracking locations of certain things, right? Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, I think it was the, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. In the past. And, uh, we continue to evaluate ways in which you can leverage things like optical character recognition mm. to identify anything from words, but also leveraging, you know, um, uh, identifying objects within images that also can place a person at a certain place in time, mm -hmm. um, or during a certain situation. You know, when we think about the, the Ukrainian war analysis, we're doing a lot of that, um, would arguably fall into the situational awareness category, right? right? Whereas we also know people in the OSINT industry are also using it for an investigation such as, you know, uh, things like we've seen with the insurrection or things like that, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, January 6th stuff or, um, or you know, um, doing a background check on people and things like that. So um, having the ability to, um, you know, do object analysis within images to place a person at a certain place in time without the metadata that gives us the geolocation, right, is, is a cool and interesting way in which you can evaluate that data and automating that um, within the cloud to do that automated analysis, whether you have a video, an image, um, and uh, in, in analyzing that. There's even um, analysis we've done with audio where it pulls all that out too. Um, and so, you know, during a half hour video, if you wanted to know if a specific person or a license plate or uh, a banner or something else showed up in a video that someone posted to social media, this can pull that out and categorize you and tell you, you know, when it saw it, where it saw it, other things in the background, you know, so you can then oh, determine, wow. Hey, wow, this was in New York City versus Tokyo, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very cool. Um, yeah. So the, so the software essentially will, will do all that heavy lifting for you because Man, I, 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 that would have been so helpful to have that tech when I was just, you know, pouring through tons of images and videos back when I was doing investigations, because that was a pain. And then, you know, you got to watch the whole thing. You try to keep your eye open for something. It's like, okay, hey, maybe we can get a location on this because of that street sign way back there. And when I could have mm -hmm. just searched for the street sign as, a, as an actual string and then pulled it out. And that mm -hmm. is freaking amazing uh, how far things have come. Uh, yeah, sure. it is. It's, it's pretty fascinating. There's a lot of cool tools and technology around that. So, so out of, um, I, I guess the, the information that you have collected, um, you know, I mean, it, it's just horrific what's going on over there, but what, what do you think is probably the most eye opening thing that you've seen from just the data, whether it's an investigative perspective, um, what's the most interesting thing that, that you realize that it's like, hey, we can get this information and, uh, you know, um, really take it and analyze it. Is there anything that was a, a big surprise or a, a gotcha moment? Yeah, there were a few. Um, we'll save a few for the webinar next week. Okay, um, fair enough. But I, I can share a couple um, that were really, really interesting. One is, did we fundamentally debunk the question surrounding the trustworthiness of this data? 
-hmm. no question about it. Based on our approach and the data we collected, it absolutely was trustworthy enough to mm -hmm. be cross-validated across these social networks. And furthermore, um, what we're seeing as a follow-on headline news, maybe the next day or the following day, thus further validating that. Now we know, you know, even with headline news, they get some things wrong, right? But again, oh, oh having all those data points and bringing them together increases the trustworthiness of it, right? Rather than an individual data point that, hey, I read it on, you know, X, Y, Z, uh, you know, news or something, right? <laughs> right. Um, now, um, the other interesting thing then was um, the predictive analysis. So great, we could, you know, we saw a variety of things across tweets. Um, across what was posted on Discord and other um, social networks where, you know, you have images and video of uh, troops and tanks and things being destroyed. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting sidebars that I did was um, places of worship, lots mm -hmm. of churches, but also mosques and other things that are scattered across the Ukraine. Um, as an individual kind of data point, if you will, I started tracking churches as they were being destroyed. And what was very interesting is they overlapped perfectly to all the sightings of Russian troops and tanks and things like that. Furthermore, um, you know, cross validating that data across the other social networks we were monitoring, Facebook, Instagram, and Discord, they were very much validated across the board. If you start to plot those on like a Google map, let's say, uh, using my maps, you could actually go in there, plot those on a map, and see like a chronological, um, you know, timeline of where troops were correlated to when buildings or places of worship were being mm -hmm. destroyed. So much so that we would predict in the next week, they would then be at this location. And sure enough, as we continued to monitor the data, those that predictive analysis was 100% correct. Wow. So if you look, you know, as they crossed the border from Russia into the Ukraine, made their way towards Kiev and each, you know, smaller town or city where things were being destroyed and sightings were being posted, it definitely led you to Kiev and even beyond. All things that we predicted, all 100% actually occurred as well. So the data was very, very legitimate. Uh, um, and I felt, you know, just simply, you know, based on that fact, but many others as well. Wow, that's, that's pretty amazing. And especially... I mean, just in today's world, you get some some weird people out there that just repost anything. You know, for, for mm -hmm. example, I have relatives, right? I'm going to leave them nameless for the sake of peaceful Thanksgivings and Christmases. But, um, you know, that just see something and they're reposting it as, oh, that's a fact, just because they saw it on whatever social media that was, or they'll add their mm -hmm. own little commentary to it and then push it on a little further. Um, mm -hmm. Is that something you guys saw as well? Um you know, collecting some of this data as well. And people just, you know, Hey, it's, that's, that's where my brain sees it. So by God, that's what happened. Yeah. I mean, very much so. Although I would say, um, we saw a lot less of that because based on our collection, we were focused on, um, posts originating from within that region mm -hmm. versus global, right? right? We did monitor global as well to cross correlate and compare you know, <laughs> those right. types of things. And outside of specifying a geo in which we wanted to monitor almost like, Hey, these are people that are actually there, you know, that are making posts. And even though they're retweeted, they're being retweeted by other people still, you know, in that region, right. Or they would have a follow on picture of the same church that's destroyed, but from a different angle, you know, um, that actually helped us further validate the legitimateness of the, I don't know if that's a word, but legitimateness of the, the actual data, uh, um, you know, surrounding, you know, something being destroyed. And, and what was really cool is um, people in that region, I think, understood that the rest of us around the world are monitoring what's going on and that we can help spread that news such that they would include uh, um, the time at which they were there. So in their tweet, even though the image itself wouldn't have that date and time and stuff because the metadata stripped yet we get collected it from that city or that region um we were able to actually determine that like based on their tweet they'd actually put in the day and time at which they were they took that picture you know which mm -hmm. was really interesting 
um, I saw that weeded out quite a bit within Discord, which was incredibly informative, where there are uh, channels and stuff on Discord where a lot of that stuff was being posted. So, Yeah, that's, that, that's amazing. Now, is, this, is the technology that you're using, obviously there's some, uh, a lot of openness to it as well, but I know you guys have, uh, have kind of developed some, some tech as well. Um, mm -hmm. at, at Silent Signals, if someone's interested in this and learning more about it, how, how do they go about this and, and to, to maybe, hey, they, maybe they want to start collecting information on a different scenario or, or add to the, the effort that's going on? Yeah, what we've created, we're, we're offering um, uh, a beta trial of uh, today on the OSINT side. And um, you know, if you are interested in it, you can reach out to info at silentsignals.com uh, to, um, you know, entertain, um, you know, trying out the tool and seeing if it might be helpful uh, in your either situational awareness, you know, um, analysis or uh, whether you're doing background checks or, you know, um, you know, a whole variety of different OSINT perspectives by which people use that data. Um, this is clearly kind of a geo OSINT focused kind of tool, but it does cross correlate the people that are making the posts to relationships they have to other accounts and things like that. Yeah. I mean, this is, when you think about the possibilities with this, um, you know, I mean, there's, there's tragedy and, and disaster. And I'm not saying that obviously that's the only thing this should be used under. It's very helpful for investigators to collect this information so they can figure out what happened and hopefully prevent these in the future. There's a, a lot of different applications, right? There are like, let's say, for example, um, your organization is looking to monitor a store location that's in another country mm -hmm. um, where, where you're either building a new store or something like that. And in that region, the people are very much against the company. And let's say that they start to uh, post, you know, um, tweets and things like that saying they're going to target that location or let's protest that location. That kind of data is very valuable to that organization, right? To either increase the security, you know, surrounding um, that facility that they're building um, or um, increasing um, their, their, you know, uh, monitoring of the activities that are going on, right? Um, so, you know, you know, it goes beyond just kind of monitoring a war or things like that. But if you're, right. you know, if you have, um, you know, uh, like a building or something that you're building there that you want to monitor, you know, activities around and what the sentiment is surrounding that to perhaps an impending hurricane or something in a region, and you want to monitor, you know, what may be going on there, not only in terms of damage, but, you know, um, are, you know, just there's a variety of ways in which the, the data can be leveraged in a very, you know, productive and useful manner. Yeah, absolutely. And I know, I, I know we've been talking really focused on Ukrainian war. That's, that's where you've gathered your data and the, and the, your, your webinar next week, which by the way, if you're just clicking in, there's a link down there. Hey, Jared, uh, there's a, a link down there to, um, to register for that webinar. But, um, you know, obviously in, uh, you know, as, as something as big as uh, as a war, you know, a lot of people think that, well, this is way above me and beyond me. But, you know, you bring this down to a more local level, like to uh, local law enforcement, um, um, even up to the larger scale law enforcement. This is something that a tool that they could utilize. Uh, and that's why I, I'm a, such a big fan of this. And I really encourage people to start learning uh, more about OSINT is um, you know, a, a few summers back, you know, there was a lot of uh, violence in the streets, right? A lot of things. And uh, a lot of that was organized via social media. Is that right? It was. Um, and there is, you know, kind of another strong use case as to why organizations use this approach to gain that additional intelligence, but also vet out, you know, the fake news and things like that. Um, you can start to see an increase in the activity in a specific region or hone mm -hmm. in on that specific cross street, you know, within the city to monitor activity. Also, you know, if there are other things like um, there are cities that monitor this, like when um, a game or something gets out right All at right. a um, auditorium or at a, you know, um, uh, stadium or something like that. And if there's start, you know, if some kind of, um, you know, 
activity starts to occur, whether it be damage or fights or things like that, it can be very valuable, right? You can only have so many boots on the ground to ensure the safety of the majority of the people that are attending, you know, that event. Um, but, uh, you know, if things start to get out of control, you know, if there's, you know, threats and things like that, it really allows you to kind of crowdsource that data, leverage it to, you know, then um, hone in on that specific area and, you know, uh, contain the the situation. Right. And it's, and it's really valuable. And, and this just crossed my mind as you were talking about this, especially, you know, like Twitter has the ability to block out certain times within their feed, right. Where you can't go back and access things in their feed, or at least they used to, I'm assuming they still have that in place. But, um, like if you're watching it live while it's happening and active, say, you know, when the game lets out of the stadium and then, you know, <laughs> hashtags or whatever start emerging. I'm, I'm very much paraphrasing here, like hashtag burn it down or whatever is happening. Mm-hmm. Then you're watching and collecting all of this stuff live within that geo where you can go back and whether that footage has been deleted, blocked out, that's in the investigator's hands already. It's too late. No, no, no deleting tweets essentially. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So, you know, um, it's known that some of the social networks, you know, for a variety of reasons may take tweets down or, you know, posts down, things like that. By leveraging this live data collection analysis, you're effectively doing it before the takedown. So there may be very valuable data there. Again, Mm -hmm. that's open source um, that you can collect and archive. And that's exactly what we do is, you know, um, have the ability to collect that um, in the event that maybe later on or shortly afterwards it is taken down, you know, so it's archived, you have the images, you have the video, you have the tweet, like all of that information. Um, and, and yeah, it, so that unto itself can be very, very valuable to it. You know, something that occurred at a certain place at a certain point in time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And if you guys also, I want to mention this too, if you're, if you're interested more in getting a hold of Mike, um, I'm not going to, post his email into the chat because otherwise he will never forgive me as spam bots attack him <laughs> uh, regularly, but you can, his website link is down there and you can find the contact form there in, uh, and, and get a hold of Mike. Uh, and he's happy to, to help you out. I tell you what, um, Mike, Mike, when, how long, I mean, I've met you a few years ago, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. at, uh, yeah. in person, where was it? Uh, cause it was before PFIC I'd met you, um, that conference, where was it? Uh, we had, we went to the pizza place. It was uh, we were with Chet yes. Hosmer. Man, I can't remember yeah. where that was. Now was that a what it, event? Was it was that? actually PFIC. Yeah, was it? yeah, it was. Yep, yep. Oh, yeah, that's right. Up, it was. Yeah, up in, in the mountains. Old lo- old location. We had gone around the corner to that. Uh, okay, now yeah, that was a pizza location. That was some pretty good pizza though. See, I remember it food. Was, was very- <laughs> <laughs> food is a good memory trigger for me. Nothing else, but but food. Same here. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So I got a funny story. Uh, so uh, if you guys don't know Mike, he's he's just such an awesome guy. We had went to dinner. Now, this is when my, my wife had gone to PFIC, right? And we had gotten those free coupons for that ice cream. And if you don't know Mike, you know, that's his like kryptonite. That's like, uh, it's like he, he absolutely loves ice cream. And uh and, and him and my wife had never met and they, you guys met, that was at that dinner you had first met, right? Yep. Yep. And we finally realized we had a commonality because I know right. your wife loves ice cream too. <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. She has this crazed uh, addiction to, uh, to ice cream, but um, it was funny. This massive ice cream came out and I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. The thing was like this bit, it was huge, right? In this glass thing. And my wife, you know, all, you know, she's so tiny. And then, uh, she goes, I, I mean, there's no way I'm going to finish this. Do you want it? Mike said, oh, yeah. I got my bar. And he took it and he, and he finished it up. And my wife, I remember the look. She goes like, wow, he does like ice cream. It was like an instant like, hey, this guy's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I've never forgotten that story. It was, it was pretty funny uh, to be there live when it when it actually happened. Um, so hang on a second. Sorry, I'm trying to filter through. If you guys have questions, I'm looking at my notes and it flipped off my screen here. Uh, if you guys have questions uh, for Mike and anything really related to OSINT capabilities um, and, the, and the things that he's talked about um, here. Now, obviously, you're going to have another opportunity. There's a webinar that's uh, that's coming up uh, and the link is in the description below this video somewhere down there, um, which you can sign up at any time for. 
But also make sure you ask in chat. I'm, I'm watching the live chat. You know, I see uh, Gloria said hello some time ago. I replied back in chat. And of course, Jared's hanging out as well. Megan's in there. So um, ask those questions uh, while you can of Mike live, because obviously in a webinar scenario, it's a little bit different because there's a little bit larger of a crowd. And, uh, you know, uh, and I know uh, the platform that Mike's going to be presenting in doesn't always see chat directly. He's more focused on on the presentation end of it. So this is kind of a, just our, our laid back, you know, kind of hang out. Um, if I had uh, beverages here, I'd be drinking them, uh, but I don't. I forgot to, to go upstairs and, and get it uh, ahead of time because <laughs> it's Friday, right? And why not? Sure. Yeah. And uh, so, Mike, what else is going on? Um, you're you're pretty busy with uh, with things over there at, at Silent Signals. Is there anything um, that you guys are wanting to talk about, or where um, you know some of the things that you guys are up to over there? Yeah, yeah, we've been continuing to do a lot of research around uh, OSINT, uh, furthermore, uh, fake image analysis. And then uh, another area that we have focused on for a while is um, forensic analysis um, around uh, network breaches um, and anomaly analysis. So we have a, another product we call Silent Defender, mm. um, which could be used to, in industrial control systems, industrial IoT, IoT type scenarios if you want to monitor for uh, anomalistic activity. And what's great about it is it can run on something as simple as a Raspberry Pi. So it's very cost no effective. Kidding. Use it at a water tower location if you wanted to, right? So wow. the, it's um, it's something we've done research, authored a book on, presented at the RSA conference on. So there's lots of, you know, um, lots of information about that too. Uh, and we've worked with organizations in that regard, uh, whether they just want to do ongoing monitor uh, monitoring, or if they want to use it for a point in time forensic investigation where they feel they may have an infected network or mm -hmm. they want to do postmortem forensics, um, in a, in a network environment. So, um, so yeah, we've been really busy and we have an upcoming talk, uh, this summer in a couple of weeks at DEF CON. Um, and there'll be lots of other things we've got going on too, throughout the rest of the year. Are do you actually, how do you, how do you get on the Wi-Fi at DEF CON? I'm just curious. Do you just like, I, don't and you just go dark for yeah. you know the week you're out there <laughs> yeah i i effectively don't and i um i have a burner phone that i use <laughs> to stay in touch with people so yeah um um so yeah i mostly stay out and then when i get home i tend to like image my laptop and everything wipe it and re-image it you know uh, okay. even when i'm hardwire plugged into like in my hotel room too like i just yeah, it's a, you know, a true zero trust environment. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Man, I could imagine those, uh, you know, the security people at, at that work at those hotels, right? They probably hate life those those weeks because there's two back to back, isn't there? Or, or there are. are yeah, they, they have Black Hat and then they have DEF CON. And I've actually worked in in the back room um, in their SOC during the conference, too. Oh, really? I can't say for what casinos, but for multiple casinos. Yeah. Uh, through a place I used to work for. And um, uh, it's interesting all the stuff that they are monitoring, both from, um, you know, uh, like from a, a Wi Fi and wireless attack perspective, but all the other things that um, that are going on there from social engineering to mm. all kinds of stuff. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, and, and people do get caught and they do get arrested, you know, there at the show. So it does happen, you know, and few people, you know, end up doing some really dumb things, you know, but, oh, uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's a great show because I, I think, you know, at DEF CON, there's no better place you're going to find, um, all the cool and interesting research and immerse yourself in the culture of that for three and a half days mm -hmm. to really, um, raise your level of awareness around all the research and attacks that are going on. You know, more recently they have um, breakout sessions around attacking voting machines and all kinds of things, right? So um, it's a really a, a tremendous experience. And if you've never gone, I, I highly recommend it. I've been going for 20 plus years and really trying to never miss it. Although during COVID, I missed a couple of years of it. But other than that, I normally go every year. It's it's been on my bucket list as long as I can possibly remember. I tried to get uh, past jobs to send me right, so I didn't have to yeah. the cost. <laughs> but I, now I work for myself. I'm like, dang, gun it. <laughs> yeah, uh, so yeah. getting What's out nice there, is it's not very expensive, which is yeah. good. I think this year it's three hundred and forty nine dollars for the three and a half days, which is not bad uh, for a conference price. Um, and you know you can find pretty good deals on casino hotels at you know. You know, if you book far enough in advance. So, oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And, so. and it's Vegas. You'd you'd probably lose more money sitting on a, a casino floor than you would <laughs> actually exactly. coming out there <laughs> the trip. <laughs> Although I have got a little knack for blackjack. At least I think I do, but that usually is what gets you, right? You think you're good at something, right. and you're like, oh, the first time you get hammered, it's like, oh, man. <laughs> That's the dangerous part. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you ever hit the tables when you're out there at all? I'm mostly a craps guy. So I love playing oh, okay. craps, which I feel is a little bit more of a team sport, right? Yeah. It's like everybody playing against the house. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I'll, I'll usually play, but usually on the cheap tables, it's more for the entertainment <laughs> than anything. So. Oh yeah, for sure. A absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, guys. Uh, again, uh, if you got any questions for Mike, uh, not necessarily about any of his uh, crap table advice or anything like that, but um, uh, all of the stuff that we've talked about with uh, from OSINT up to uh, some of the network forensics information, make sure you pop it in there. If not, um, his website's down there, uh, silentsignals.com. Um, you can you can jump down, click the link, and uh, and contact him that way. And that way, uh, if uh, a lot of people don't like to ask in the crowd some 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 questions and I, and I get that, uh, sometimes there's sensitive work information there that they need to ask. So it's always best to, to provide that other alternative for them. Um, so now you have it. Um, so obviously you're headed to DEF CON. We know that now. Um, mm -hmm. where else are you headed? I know there's a couple others, right? Yeah, probably, uh, PFIC and osmosis con as well. Okay. So PFIC is going to be in Nashville this year, right? Yeah, that's yep. and Osmosis Con will be cool. in Tampa. Tampa, and that's going to be awesome too. You know, the first Osmosis Con I went to was just last year. That was the very first one with uh, with Cynthia, and uh, she was uh, man. I just got an email from her. She was supposed to be on the show next week, and she has to reschedule for another week. Talk on it. <laughs> We've been oh, okay. if anyone's <laughs> seen her image in our live feed, it just keeps getting bumped down. It's like two months straight now. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. We'll get her out there. But that was the first time I had gone to that show and it was it was really eye opening. I met some really awesome people. Have you have you ever been to her show before? I haven't, no, but I know it tends to be very OSINT focused. Oh yeah. Um, so Extremely. you know, we figured surrounding this cool research and topic and everything we've been doing the last few years, we had to get involved because we we know her as well. So and, and we know she puts on a, an incredible show. Yeah, it uh, it was it was absolutely amazing. I again, I walked away with that show having a brand new respect for OSINT, and you know, I, I don't know if you know this, but she started out I think as a librarian, if I'm if I'm accurate. Um, really? And, yeah, and that's where her love for OSINT and obviously information, all open source mm -hmm. stuff, was. And so she actually had some librarians talk uh, during the show about how you can go about getting pieces of information and how easy it is to, you know, people forget that, you know, they're so glued to, they're so thinking, oh, it's technology based, computer based, that people forget to go in to the most common places, which is your library to get information. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was blown away. I was like, man, this is absolutely amazing uh, from, from the speakers yeah. there. So looking forward to it for sure. Very cool. Very cool. So if you guys are going to be at Osmosis Con, make sure you, uh, you, you check out Mike. Now you guys, you guys have a booth there. Yes. No, you haven't decided yet. No, we haven't decided as of yet. Okay. Okay. So. Either way, make sure you, uh, you find Mike, you know what he looks like now. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> people coming to, uh, there, hold on. What is Jared? It's got a question here. Hold on. I'm going to pop this up here on the screen. Uh, there it is. So Jared says, what's the best way to see samples or a demo of silent defender? Um, or the fake image analysis. Uh, yeah, um, so you can reach out to us anytime at info at silentsignals.com. And I'm more than happy to follow up with you, Jared, um, give you any kind of information you you know you want to uh, know about, you know, either of those products, or if you wanted a, a, a demo or anything like that, or, a, a, you know, a trial. So oh, very cool. I know Jared's a tinker, he likes to, to, to do things like that, too. So that'll be, it'll be a good, uh, a good one for you. Um, Megan says the librarians talk at osmosis con was fantastic. Last year. Yeah, it was it, uh, it, that really blew me away. And I know it sounds super nerdy, right? That's, and I got my nerd glasses on today for that reason, but, um, man, it was, it was, it was very eye opening, uh, for sure. Um, all right. Jared says, cool. Thanks. Hey, you're welcome, Jared. Uh, Make sure that you, you know, make sure you check up uh, Mike, either that email address, go to his website and, uh, and go that way. So I'm looking, I'm kind of scrolling through the feed as I ramble to. Is there anything else, Mike, you wanted to touch on 
that uh, we may have missed? Because I'm sure there's something. No, I think this this was fantastic, and really looking forward to next week to talk in detail about the uh, you know the research and um, some of the metrics, and um, I'll have some slides and and things that'll show. Um, how we map things on uh, Google My Maps and mm. how we leverage that data for the predictive analysis and some of the other interesting artifacts that we found, you know, during the research. So uh, hopefully um, you'll really enjoy it. So I'm I'm going to be there. And normally I don't. I, it's hard for me to break away to get to a webinar. I usually have to watch them in a recorded mode. But this one, yeah. I will be there. I will be there live for this one because I'm I'm really interested in this topic. Excited to to learn a little bit more about it. And again. Awesome. The link to it is, and I know I've said this a few times, but if you pop it in and out or watching it later, is down in the, the description. Because I know people, when they're watching YouTube videos, kind of just scroll and looking for the good parts, <laughs> right? Uh, but, you know, don't miss that. It's down there in the description. You can absolutely register for it uh, and get things get things moving. Uh, Mike, thanks so much, man. I really appreciate... Um, oh, hang on. Uh, who was from Cleveland? Just saying that because they were from Cleveland. Who I what I miss? I missed something. Did I say something about someone being from Cleveland? I I missed it completely. Mike, you don't know either, because okay, so otherwise Mike would have filled in the blank. I have no idea <laughs> what it was. Um, and Megan's going to clarify here because we got to remember, uh, Mike, you and I are living like five to six seconds into the future. Um, so I I don't know why I I, I guess it's just the latency issue with uh, with YouTube when we set this up. Uh, my screen is pretty chaotic for those of you guys who hasn't, haven't seen this control panel that I'm actually on. We're not, we don't use YouTube natively to go live. We use this uh, uh, tool uh, called Ecamm if you're interested in it. I'm, I don't make any money from those guys. I just uh, really uh, uh, like their software that they make. And, but there, it does put a delay. Um, you know, in back when I was, cause uh, my history is a radio guy. I was a radio DJ for uh, man, multiple years, like 10 years, something like that. And uh, the reason for the delay before was the bad word button, right? If somebody would say something, you could hopefully hit that button and cover it up for like uh, in, in that 10 second delay uh, because the button was not on a delay. It would go out live, but your broadcast was, so you'd have to time that. Anyway, uh, that's the whole story behind that, if you really even care. Um, oh, the librarians. That's right, Megan. Doc, you got a better memory than I do. She said the librarians were from uh, from Cleveland. Um yeah, I forgot all about that. She remembered. That's awesome. All right, guys. Um, Mike, thank you very much. And I'm looking for last minute questions. I don't see any more other than the one that uh, that Jared had as I scroll through here. Again, you can sign up. Um, Mike, you're also in Cyber Social Hub, right? So if people want to get a hold of you, they can kind of uh, go through that way um, and, uh, and and look you up through there. Um, so again, thanks again, Mike. I really, really appreciate you uh, you hanging out with us on this uh, on the Friday afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. It's always a great talk and uh, uh, really appreciate um, all the uh, activity that we normally have you know, on, on these types of things. So yeah. I'm looking forward to the webinar next week. Yeah. There's a lot of information in this one. Normally we got a lot more time for, uh, for crazy stories, but it seemed like you had so much information that we didn't have a whole lot of crazy story time. Minus the NASDAQ incident. We did talk about that, but um, right. You know, <laughs> other than that, <laughs> it was it was no the ice cream. We did talk about ice cream too. So sure. that's good. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, we'll see you next week. Um, we will have a guest for you lined up. Someone will be here for that. But in the meantime, make sure you hit that link below. Oh, also, uh, again, my kids always tell me this: say, "Hey, you gotta tell them, Dad, to like and subscribe to your channel, and then hit the little bell to be notified when you go live." So there, I have now officially done that. So you guys just hit the little like, and uh, if you subscribe to the channel, you'll uh, you'll know when these things uh, come up because we, we try to do these every Friday. Occasionally, we have a little hiatus, especially in the in the summertime, um, just because uh, so busy with everything else. But there's also a link down there to register for Mike's webinar, so make sure you click that. Uh, Mike, hang out. Don't go anywhere yet, uh, and I'll talk to you right after the show here. Um, other than that, well, guys, we'll see you, and make sure you join Cyber Social Hub, and we'll see you guys next week. Thanks, Mike. Thanks.